to the making of the American Revolution. But I'm going to explain uh, over the course of this video lecture and then our Zoom discussion next week exactly what that means. Uh, but as you'll remember from the end of our discussion last week, uh, the year 1763 was a major turning point. Uh, that year, uh, the Treaty of Paris was uh, ratified, agreed to and ratified, which, uh, amongst many other things, uh, gave Great Britain uh, French, formerly French territory in North America. And if you scroll down to the map uh, that's just below, the map just after the title slide, there you go, uh, you can get a really good view of it if you look at that map. Uh, it's on slide number two. Uh, what had formerly been, again, French North America becomes British North America. So go ahead and take a look at that and you can really understand the extent to which uh, there was a significant transfer of territory. Uh, now, as we left off with the last class, and this is exactly where I want to pick up today, uh, if you scroll down to a slide that's called The Crisis Begins in 1763, uh, the aftermath of the Seven Years' War, uh, also known as the French and Indian War, as I mentioned last week, uh, is the beginning point for what eventually would become the American Revolution. Go drink some iced coffee. Excuse me. Still need my coffee, even if I'm not feeling. <clears throat> Beginning in 1763, as you can see on that slide, we have the uh, emergence of what uh, historians now call Pontiac's War. Uh, that's a reference to a, uh, a confederation, an alliance of Native American tribes uh, in the Ohio River Valley. And actually, if you scroll back up to the map uh, that I just mentioned, you can, if you look at the very sort of center left of the map, uh, these tribes include the Delawares, the Wyandots uh, in particular, uh, and the Shawnee and Cherokee. So if you look just sort of in the center of that map, this is the confederation of tribes led by Pontiac, their military leader, uh, which rose uh, in uh, what white colonists called rebellion, uh, but now historians call it just simply a war, uh, who rose to attempt to prevent British North American colonists from moving westward. This alarmed the British Empire so much uh, to the extent uh, that the British King, King George III, proclaimed in 1763 a so-called proclamation line. Uh, and again on that map, if you look, it's the red line that snakes up the map from bottom to top. Uh, this was an imaginary line, uh, but a line in which, as per the King of England, King George III, the British North American colonists could not cross. They were prevented from moving westward beyond that imaginary line, which snakes through the center of the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, and, and this proclamation line uh, did two things. Uh, because it prevented British North American colonists from accessing newly British North American territory, began to alienate some groups of colonial society. For example, Poor farmers seeking access to new and cheap lands west of that line. And on the very other, the very opposite end of the socioeconomic spectrum, very wealthy colonists who had hoped to speculate to make a huge profit off of buying big chunks of Western land and then selling it. Why did the British Empire impose this line? Why did King George back in London impose this line? because of the simple fact that the British Empire was facing a, this is going into the second point, a massive debt that was accrued during the Seven Years' War. Pontiac's War, this again, Native American alliance seeking to prevent British North American colonists from expanding westward, <clears throat> the King of England feared, would be yet another costly war, just like the Seven Years' War had been a very costly war. So by imposing this line, King George III hoped to prevent paying for another war that began in North America. If you remember it to, back to last class, the so-called French and Indian War, a.k.a. the Seven Years' War actually began in North America with a clash at the Ohio River. So after 1763, after the, <clears throat> the imposition of this proclamation line, what we begin to see from the British Empire, <coughs> excuse me, uh, is <coughs> a new tax policy 
uh, intended to address the astounding amount of debt that the British Empire had taken out from financial institutions in order to fight the French and their Indian allies. And I give you a number there, 122 million pounds, which is a drop in the bucket today, to be, to be sure, when the United States national debt is, I think, 22 trillion. But at the time was the largest debt that a government had ever uh, accrued. So this new colonial tax policy combined with the proclamation line are the first building blocks to colonial protests, which, as we'll see, would eventually become uh, the American Revolution. Uh, the new to colonial tax policy took a couple of different forms, and I give you one under the bullet point that says new colonial tax policy, uh, an attempt to more strictly enforce uh, navigation acts, acts that were intended to tax trade uh, between the Americas and Europe, uh, acts which between 1700 to 1763 had largely not been entirely enforced because as we talked about last class, the British imperial economy was flourishing, so it wasn't deemed necessary <clears throat> before 1763 to enforce those acts. Uh, facing this war debt, uh, the British ministry decided that it would once again enforce these acts. Uh, and from the perspective of North America, the most important aspect that I want us to remember is that the stricter enforcement of these acts meant in practice tamping down on illegal smuggling, the illegal purchase and sale, purchase and importation of goods by British North American colonists. And the single biggest commodity that was illegally smuggled into North America was sugar, uh, in particular by New England merchants. And this gets us to the last point on this slide, uh, the Sugar Act of 1764. Uh, this act actually was not even a new act. Uh, it wasn't even a, an additional tax. Uh, sometimes we, we think about the events leading to the American Revolution as a series of escalating taxes, and that's why the American Revolution occurred. And that's most forcefully uh, stated and thought about in the term no taxation without representation. We'll get to that uh, in this video lecture. Uh, but in fact, the very first act that is usually considered to be a tax that was actually not a tax, or at least not a tax rise. The Sugar Act from 1764 actually was in addition to a law that was passed in 1733, so about 30 years previous. Uh, that earlier act, which was called the Molasses Act, uh, molasses being a byproduct of the sugar, uh, sugar cane processing process, the Sugar Act uh, it was in addition to this earlier act uh, that actually lowered a tax that had previously existed. So the 1733 law decreed that there would be a tax for North American colonists who wanted to import sugar or molasses. They would have to pay six cents per gallon. The Sugar Act lowered that to three cents per gallon, but strengthened the collection mechanisms. That earlier Molasses Act had in effect never been actually collected. The Sugar Act lowered the tax by one half, but provided for more, again, stringent and actual collection. And the response to the Sugar Act from New England merchants, uh, the group of people in North America who were the primary targets of this act and the earlier 1733 act was to rise in protest and they began to develop an argument that i just referred to that i'll flesh out further as we move forward uh, today uh, which is that they began to argue that the sugar act of 1764 uh, and the earlier molasses act of 1733 were illegitimate because the north american colonists uh, did not consent to it because they did not have representation in Parliament, meaning that they did not elect North Americans to travel to Parliament in England to participate in the creation of these laws. Now, this is just the very beginning of colonial protest, more coffee. 
And I want to be very clear about something uh, right now up front. This is especially important uh, given the slide I'm about to talk about. Uh, at no point in, 17, in the 1760s <clears throat> was anybody in North America arguing that there should be an independent North America. That is to say that the North American colonies should declare independence from the British Empire. And that was not a part of the conversation. What we're seeing is bubbling protest which over time, by 1776, uh, would burst open into an independence movement. Having said that, if you scroll down to the next slide or flip over to the next slide called the Stamp Act and Colonial Protest, what we can see as historians retrospectively is that things changed in a very fundamental way in 1765. Conditions I'll be more specific, not just things. Conditions changed in a fundamental way in 1765. Uh, and that's with the passage of the Stamp Act. And, and, and I should say, if you've ever learned about the American Revolution before, and I'm sure you have in a high school class, maybe, or maybe another college history class, you're probably familiar with the Stamp Act. It's the single most well-known uh, and in many respects most important uh, piece of legislation uh, that ultimately would be a spur to the American independence movement. And so the Stamp Act, which as you can see was passed in March of 1765, just to be specific, March 22nd, 1765 to be more specific, uh, was a law passed by Parliament uh, to apply to the British North American colonies. Uh, that uh, in simple terms was a tax on printed materials in legal documents. So anything that required paper, basically. Uh, was taxed. And, and this ran the gamut from very uh, important and expensive legal contracts uh, all the way down to playing cards, which were also made out of paper. And so what the Stamp Act did was it provided for a series of taxes that would have to be paid depending on uh, the particular item. So actually, if you scroll down to ooh, three slides down, uh, awarding by the Sons of Liberty, and I'll talk about that in a second. And this is also in America, you have chapter five as well. Uh, you can see uh, it's on the handwritten warning, uh, which again, I'll talk about. If you look on the left side of that page, you can see images of the different kinds of stamps. So they varied in, in value. The cheapest ones at the top of this image, well, the one penny one was for things like decks of playing cards, just minus small stuff. Uh, the more, much more expensive ones, which you can see at the bottom left of that, were for uh, legal documents. And the purpose of the Stamp Act was to raise revenue, uh, and not just to raise taxes for the purpose of sending those taxes back to the mother country. The purpose, actually, of the Stamp Act was to tax the North American colonies so that the British imperial bureaucracy, which was stationed in North America, could pay for itself. So really, this was an attempt by Parliament to get the British North American colonists to pay for their own portion of the British imperial government that was stationed in North America. And the Stamp Act, uh, as soon as the colonists heard about it, which they began to hear about it in June of 1765. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, we live in the 21st century, but in the 18th century, it took news uh, anywhere from 8 to 12 weeks to travel from Europe to North America and vice versa. And it actually took longer to travel uh, from Europe to North America because of the way that the currents in the Atlantic Ocean are. So the colonists didn't find out about this until June of 1765, uh, and they immediately were furious. Uh, and that's not every single person in North America, but it's definitely fair to say that the Stamp Act really alienated uh, large chunks of British North American society. Why? It was a new kind of tax. Unlike previous taxes that had been levied on the British North American colonies going all the way back to the 17th century, it was even different than the Sugar Act, which I just talked about. Why? Because it was an internal tax rather than an external tax. What does that mean? An internal tax, in this case, refers to a tax upon transactions that happened entirely within North America, whereas an external tax was a tax levied on the purchase and sale of commodities from North America 
to Europe or from North America to the Caribbean or from North America to Africa. So external is taxes on trade, internal taxes on transactions within North America. Uh, this was what was so alienating about it. Uh, this is why the colonists responded in an extremely harsh way. Uh, and uh, the responses took, in general, three different forms. Uh, these forms could be overlapping, and they often were. Uh, individuals often participated in one or two or three of these, all three of these types of protests at the same time. The first kind of protest, uh, and, and this is also explained very nicely in American Yacht Chapter 5, uh, was official petitions. Uh, these were legislative <coughs> protests uh, framed in the language of the law uh, that were uh, official statements by colonial legislatures. For example, uh, the Virginia House of Burgesses created the most well-known set of resolutions against the Stamp Act in which they explain in bullet-pointed form all of the reasons why they believe the Stamp Act to be wrong. In 1765, in October of 1765, actually nine of the 13 colonies sent delegates to meet in New York City to form a Stamp Act Congress, uh, a semi-unified body of delegates from again, nine of the 13 colonies, so about 70%, which also created a set of resolutions. Uh, these official petitions were forwarded to parliament and to the ministry all the way up to the king. And in sum, if we were to generalize, they more or less had similar arguments. Uh, and the official petitions tended to pivot around the argument about representation that I referred to earlier, that the Stamp Act is wrong, it's illegitimate, because the North American colonists did not consent to it because they did not have actual representation in Parliament. Yeah, frankly, that's important, but the boring kind of protest, the reading official petitions created by elite white men using legal language, now they're important. Much more interesting and fun kind of protest is the second kind, popular protest. This is on the ground, uh, often violent resistance to collecting the stamp tax. Uh, a popular protest uh, in beginning in 1765 was led by uh, groups of men and, and eventually women, and I'll talk about that on the next slide, groups of men who organized themselves into resistance bands that called themselves the Sons of Liberty. Uh, these were unofficial groups, which over time spread throughout the British North American colonies. The first chapter was founded in Boston, Massachusetts. But the so-called Sons of Liberties took it upon themselves to organize resistance to the Stamp Act. How did they do that? They took a couple of different forms, and actually the slides including one I just referred to, give us some sort of sense of how they did this. If you go down to, well, go down past the No Stamp Act uh, T set, which is interesting, uh, but go down to the next one, the slide that says the Sons of Liberty at the top. Uh, you can see what's called a broadside, which is a poster. It's what we would call a poster. So broadsides were printed in large format and they were put up in public places. And so what you can see on this broadside <clears throat> which, as you can see, is dated Tuesday morning, December 17, 1765. Uh, you can see the Sons of Liberty are calling a public meeting, uh, in this case, to force uh, the stamp tax collector, the official appointed for the colony of Massachusetts, to collect the tax and distribute the stamps. Uh, the Sons of Liberty, Sons of Liberty, are calling on him to resign. Uh, and it, you can read the language here, and, and you can see that they're already identifying themselves as the Sons of Liberty, saying uh, the true-born Sons of Liberty are desired to meet under the Liberty Tree at 12 o'clock today, this day, to hear the public resignation of Andrew Oliver, distributor of stamps for the province of Massachusetts Bay. Uh, a resignation? Yes. So this is a public call to force Andrew Oliver uh, to resign. Uh, and it turns out uh, that Andrew Oliver 
uh, did not show up to this <laughs> to this meeting, and then his house was destroyed actually later that night by the Sons of Liberty. They marched and they took all of his possessions out of his house and then they burnt it in the street. They broke out his windows. They committed vandalism. They saw, in effect, this is a classic Sons of Liberty technique. If you scroll down one more, you can see that the image that I already referred to uh, by pointing out the stamps is another way, an, a, another uh, common method that the Sons of Liberty used. Uh, this is a warning that was written on a piece of stamped paper, which is, again, I pointed out the individual stamps earlier. Uh, so this is meant to be uh, a very direct statement about the Stamp Act. Uh, and this is a threat that says, <clears throat> uh, the first man that either distributes or makes use of the stamped paper, uh, let him take care of his house, person, and effects. So a threat. We will. Th we are threatening harm uh, and to your person, <laughs> and we are threatening to destroy your possessions uh, if you comply with the Stamp Act, to paraphrase. And it's signed Vox Populi, which is Latin for voice of the people. And finally, it says, we dare, which is to say, we will do this if you comply with the Stamp Act. And so these are different sort of methods that the Sons of Liberty used. And again, as I said, they, they emerged first in Massachusetts, but they would quickly spread throughout North America, all the way down from uh, New England to Georgia. Uh, so this kind of protest is significant, uh, and it would continue. Uh, but sometimes much too much is made out of popular protests. Uh, you may be familiar with something called tarring and feathering, which is a, a very seldom used method, but one which did happen a few times uh, in which uh, stamp tax collectors were tortured, it's really the best way to put it, by having hot tar poured over their body and then feathers were put on them, tarring and feathering. Uh, this kind of protest was important, but sometimes it's considered to be, I think, a little bit too important in the grand scheme of <clears throat> uh, especially resistance to the Stamp Act. Uh, a final kind of, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, resistance that I want to mention, this third type of protest, is economic resistance. Uh, and these took the form of non-importation movements, movements to prevent the purchase and sale of goods from the mother country in North America as an attempt to use economic means to resist uh, the Stamp Act. Uh, and, and actually, if you go ahead and scroll down to the next slide, which is called Trade Regulation and Protest, you can get a better better sense for this kind of economic resistance. So go ahead and do that. And I'm going to talk a little bit more directly about, about uh, this non-importation movement in a second. But before I do that, I, I just want to say uh, that by 1766, uh, so the year after the Stamp Act was created, uh, Parliament uh, had heard enough about resistance to the Stamp Act that it decided to repeal it. It said, we are repealing the Stamp Act in the face of widespread resistance to it. But at the same time, they also redeclared their authority to tax the British North American colonists. So in effect, Parliament said, yeah, we will repeal this particular law, but we will make sure to make clear to you all that we retain the right to continue to pass, pa pass taxes upon you. And in 1767, uh, a new program uh, was initiated, uh, again, to raise tax revenues in the face of a massive imperial debt. Uh, and in the wake of the Stamp Act, just to add a little bit more detail, uh, the prime minister was fired and the, the administration which had imposed the Stamp Act was cleaned out and a new one was brought in. So we're bringing in new people with new ideas. Uh, and this leads to the Townsend program. Townsend for the name of the new prime minister, uh, Charles Townsend. Uh, Townsend decided, uh, and his ministry decided, that rather than mess around with another internal tax, which clearly the North American colonists would protest, that they would return to raising taxes through external means. Uh, so the Townsend program was a new program of so-called import duties, meaning taxes that North Americans would have to pay on goods that they purchased, which were imported from the mother country. Uh, and this uh, Townsend program was in effect uh, raising slightly 
taxes on primarily household goods. Uh, and if you scroll down actually to <clears throat> the next slide, you can see two images. The one on the left I want to talk about, the one on the right I'll get to in a second. Um, what's important about this, this image on the left, there are a couple of things. Oh, most importantly, uh, and I don't expect to be able to read this because the text is very small, it's a list of all of the, the items that were a part of the Townsend program. Uh, so if you if you if you have the ability to zoom in, do that. But you can see that it's mostly just household goods and uh, food items like sugar. Uh, but it's furniture, it's cloth, it's uh, just basic day to day glass, uh, tea, uh, just day to day stuff. Uh, but in the wake of the Stamp Act, if you want to move back up to the slide of text that's called Trade Regulation and Protest. In the wake of the Stamp Act, uh, what was becoming clear was that there were certain sectors of North American society that would simply refuse to pay any taxes uh, without uh, actual representation. Uh, and this leads to uh, the emergence of the third kind of protest that we saw on the previous slide, the non-importation movements. So it's in this context of 1767 that we really begin to see this emerge. And non-importation movements, as you can see, were, were local agreements made at the town and county level uh, to ban the trade and sale of British goods, meaning goods imported from uh, the mother country. Uh, and the image that I just pointed out, uh, the one on the left, is actually a it's a non-importation agreement. It's from Boston. And if you look closely, you can see the date there is October the 28th, 1767. So what this was was an agreement of merchants in Boston, and those are the merchants have all signed it there uh, at the bottom. Each individual signed it, agreeing to be a part of this. Uh, in this case, uh, the merchants in Boston ha have signed their name to an agreement that you will not sell, purchase, or sell any of the goods subject to the Townsend program. So when I refer to the individual goods, they're saying we're not going to purchase or sell this, 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 this. So it's a very long list. It's at a local agreement in Boston. And if you can, again, look at the names. You know, the vast majority of these people you'll never have heard of before because they're not famous to people, even to most historians now. There's only one who you might have heard of before, and it's the middle column. It's the third name down, which is Paul Revere. And you can see his signature there. Uh, Paul Revere was a silversmith. He made uh, expensive and fancy items out of silver. So he signed this. Uh, these non-importation movements uh, are particularly important, uh, getting down to the, the slide of text that says trade regulation, or going back up to it, because this opened up a space for women to become politicized. Oh, what does that mean? Uh, it means that it, in particular, this context of trade regulation, we see opportunities for women to become politically active in, in protesting the British Empire. Why in this context? Uh, well, primarily because non-importation movements depended on women's participation because women tended to purchase the vast majority of household goods in the 18th century. So what women began to do in a parallel fashion to their uh, male counterparts was to organize resistance chapters that they called the Daughters of Liberty, just as the men called themselves the Sons of Liberty. Uh, and they began to use this space to become politicized and to act with what historians have called a homespun virtue, uh, which means that they began to act uh, virtuously in a political sense uh, by creating movements to replace British goods with homemade items. That's what homespun means, homemade items. And actually, you can see, uh, if you scroll down to the next slide, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you can get a little flavor of that with uh, the image on the right, uh, which is another broadside, meaning a poster, uh, which was posted in Boston in January of 1770. So this is a few years after the Townsend program. But it gives us a way, a, a sense uh, of the degree to which women began to really participate. And what this is, is a it's calling out an individual merchant named William Jackson. You can see his name at the top, uh, who was importing uh, British goods uh, in violation of Boston's non-importation agreement. So what the sons and daughters of liberty did, and you can see them 
the Daughters of Liberty are clearly identified in this text. Basically, they came together and they threatened uh, anybody who would buy anything from William Jackson. So in effect, what they said is don't buy anything from William Jackson. Uh, if you do, you will bring disgrace upon yourself and your family forever. So they're trying to put William Jackson out of business. And that text at the top uh, after his name says William Jackson and Porter at the Brazen Head, north side of the townhouse and opposite the town pump in Cornhill, Boston. That long sentence is his address. <laughs> There's before the numerical addresses existed, so you had to literally describe where somebody lived. So that's where William Jackson lived. But this is really gives you a sense for, for the way in which women sort of became politicized because of uh, the non-importation agreements. Uh, what I want to do now is scroll down and you'll see a slide called uh, the uh, Loyalism and Colonial Protest. Uh, and this will be the last slide for today. Uh, and then we'll pick up the story next week when we finish discussing the American Revolution. Uh, that'll be week seven. Uh, and I want to talk about this topic now because I think it's important to do that. Uh, before we continue to talk about political protests, uh, we want to talk a little bit about uh, a very important point that is sometimes not incorporated into popular understandings of the American Revolution. Uh, and it is called loyalism, its relationship to colonial protest. And simply define loyalists and loyalism. Loyalism, that somebody who is a loyalist, describes somebody who, uh, throughout the 1760s into the 1770s, uh, not only did not participate in protests against the Stamp Act right, or against the Townsend program, but in fact remained outwardly loyal to the actions of the British Empire. The reason I like to talk about this now is because, uh, as you'll see beginning next week when we're in our Zoom meeting, uh, you're going to find me shifting gears and talking about protest, protest, protest. And that's important, but it's also important to remember that uh, uh, a large number of people, uh, again, were loyalists. Uh, and they tended to fall in a couple of different camps based on racial and ethnic, uh, socioeconomic background, racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic background. Uh, white loyalists uh, tended to come from the more privileged and wealthy sectors of British society. Uh, these were imperial office holders, people who were employed by the British Empire. And you can understand why they would remain loyal to their, their employer, um, but also Northeastern merchants. So even these, for example, merchants uh, that I've referred to just in the context of a non-importation agreement, uh, even if those merchants opposed the Townsend program, uh, it was possible to remain loyal to the British Empire. Why would a merchant remain loyal to the British Empire, but especially a wealthy merchant? Well, in short, because if one had accrued wealth and status in the British Empire, even if they opposed the particular import duties of the Townsend program, why should they decide to protest the British Empire on a larger level? It's okay to disagree with a particular portion of the Townsend program, but there are many wealthy merchants believe there's, that's no reason to protest as a whole the British Empire. Uh, Native Americans are a second major group. Uh, many Native Americans, uh, and there's no way to put an exact number on this, but it, it seems as if most Native American tribes in North America, if they had to choose, would have supported the British Empire in its attempt to tamp down on protests by the British North American colonists. Why? Well, simply put, and this is especially true of Native Americans uh, who uh, participated in Pontiac's War, which we talked about at the beginning of this uh, video. Uh, they feared that westward expansion of North American colonists would lead to uh, their displacement. And the British Empire had already made an attempt to prevent the Western expansion of its colonists, the proclamation line. So if it came down to it, most Native American groups uh, would have uh, said that they supported the British Empire. Now, that's not to say that they were uh, big fans of the British Empire, but if it came down to it, they would have uh, and ultimately did support uh, 
the attempts of the British Empire to put down the American War for Independence. Uh, the third group, which I have a question mark behind because this is a topic that, that we'll pick up with uh, immediately at the beginning of next week, uh, is black loyalists. And, and the reason I have a question mark is because you might be wondering why a free or enslaved person of African descent would support a British empire. This is an empire, so imagine you're an enslaved person in Virginia, which had consistently, uh, seemingly, uh, supported the institution of slavery. So why would you support the British Empire? At the same time, why would an enslaved or free person of color support an American protest movement? Americans themselves were the actual slaveholders while the British Empire allowed slavery to flourish. So it can be a kind of confusing set of circumstances, and that's why I have a question mark. Well, the main reason that, as we'll see next week, Enslaved people in particular actually fought against the American Revolution. Enslaved people in North America fought against American independence was because they believed that the British Empire by the 1770s, in fact, would, would be the entity that might extend freedom to them, not North American colonists. Why? Uh, because primarily of a court decision uh, in 1772 uh, called the Somerset Decision. Uh, which declared that slavery in the mother country was illegal, although it could be legal in the colonies. So it didn't actually free any slaves in the Americas, but the decision which said, quote, English air is too free for a slave to breathe, was actually misreported initially and enslaved populations in North America incorrectly believed that it de declared that they were free, that the King of England had said they're free, and that the only reason that they were still enslaved was because their masters were ignoring the King of England. So this led, as we'll see, many enslaved people in North America to actually revolt against the American Revolution. And I'm going to leave off there today. Uh, we'll pick this up next week. But by the time you see this video, you'll have also received an email from me. Uh, and I will see you next week. Thank you.